Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for joining us in this next offering at IU's Ethics, Values, and Technology series, uh, where we're digging into a lot of cutting edge issues in this space and cybersecurity, national security, ethics, um, and related areas of corporate social responsibility. And today we're joined by a true thought leader in this space, really bringing together all of these different vestiges um, of the webinar series into one, which I'm really, really excited about. So um, you are lucky, very lucky to hear from today, guys. I'm Andrea Bonin-Blanc. Um, who is a founder um, and a CEO, uh, as well as having a JD and a PhD, which is nothing to sneeze at, of a risk advisory and global governance uh, practice. She has been advising boards of directors on, on numerous issues in this space uh, for many years now. She serves on several boards and advisory boards in her own capacity as well, um, including Greenwood Partners, um, Ethical Intelligence, which is an EU-based AI ethics firm, and Protected by AI, just to name a few. Um, She's spoken to audiences around the world, um, from, from Davos to virtually here in Bloomington, Indiana today. <laughs> so we're, we're very lucky to feature her and her latest book, uh, Gloom to Boom, How Leaders Transform Risk into Resilience and Value, which was published uh, just last year. And I would highly recommend it. It quickly hit uh, Amazon's hot release number one in business ethics and game theory. So um, Andrea, thank you so, so much for joining us. Per, per usual, we'll be opening it up to questions after Andrea's remarks, but if you have anything that you'd really like to raise, um, I'll be monitoring the Q&A feature. So feel free to start adding those at any point, okay? And if it seems timely, I can interject. But thank you so much, Andrea, again, for joining us and, uh, and over to you. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a real pleasure and a joy to, to be here. Uh, especially with that beautiful background that you have, whether it's virtual or not, it, it looks like spring and that makes us feel all a little happier and more hopeful, right? Um, so I'm, I'm uh, live from New York City where we also have some nice weather today, about 60 degrees. Uh, so, you know, spring is coming. Um, but I really appreciate being part of your series and I'm going to put up a, a PowerPoint slide deck that, that I'm gonna use to walk you through a journey that I call the journey between Scylla and Charybdis. So let me start there. Uh, let's see, let me make sure it's all rigged properly. Can you see my Scylla and Charybdis picture? Yes, indeed, it looks perfect. I okay. love it. Great. <laughs> um, and as Scott said, I'm happy to, uh, you know, if there are timely questions that come up while, we're, while I'm presenting, happy to stop and, and interact. Um, so I start with this picture of, of Scylla and Charybdis. Um, as a reminder that for eons, I suppose, uh, we uh, have talked about risk and opportunity, about danger and uh, possibilities. Um, and throughout that journey, I think resilience is a really important topic and sustainability. So I like to connect the dots between risk, opportunity, resilience and sustainability. And that's kind of what I've done in my book. And I actually have the central part of my book is about um, the navigation, navigating through a, a journey, navigating through risk and opportunity in what I call ESG plus T, which is environmental, social governance and technology issues, risks and opportunities. And I really think it is a navigation, especially after what we've gone through for the last year, where everything and its brother came together at once, uh, big systemic risks, but also great opportunities uh, to make the world a better place. So. The Sill and Charybdis story, for those of you who uh, are not studying properly at uh, Indiana U or anywhere else, um, is the story of Ulysses and his ship and his crew going through untold horrors to go back to their uh, original uh, land. And they see serpents and vortexes and God knows what else. So, um, but they did get to the other side. So that's kind of what I, I like to think about, um, especially for, for leaders. And so, uh, Scott was kind enough to let me uh, show you my book <laughs> for a moment at least, um, but I, it, it kind of synthesizes, it's a, it's a labor of love that took um, not so long to write, but a long time to think about. And um, it's really this uh, navigation from gloom to boom, gloom meaning the difficult times that we're living in. I wrote the book in 2018 and 2019, it was published in 2020, and it was published before the pandemic which uh, makes me feel good in the sense that I was uh, thinking about these mega trends uh, of our turbulent times before this really big one hit, uh, because I think we all see these things coming, uh, certainly in the environmental world with climate change and the technology world with the rapid disruptive change. 
uh, and so on. So this journey is taking leaders through this uh, navigation of environmental, social governance and technology issues to a place of resilience, sustainability and value. And so what Scott asked me to talk about uh, today is how uh, we create those ethical leaders that will help us navigate through those really through our really difficult times. So I'll start off by just saying what, you know, having a, a quick sort of back and forth about what is a 21st century ethical leader. Um, and I think um, we can go back to some of the interesting sayings and uh, limericks maybe from, from the past uh, where uh, the risky kind of leader, the, the, the dark side of leadership um, can be seen through some of these quotes. Uh, everybody's, I think, familiar with the fish rots from the head. It's not something that, that the mafia invented. It's something that apparently the ancients invented at some point. And then there's a, another quote here from Seneca, first century Roman philosopher, um, who I won't say it in Latin, I'll say it in English as translated by uh, Benjamin Franklin or attributed to him. If you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. So to me, that is the, it sort of represents the idea that you, you have a bad leader, you have a difficult leader, a, a leader who is not leading and, and um, you know, ethically in, uh, in a way that's representative of the stakeholders, that person, creates a culture that is um, basically full of mm, similar sycophants and uh, sociopaths. So um, that's kind of uh, the milieu of the, of the dark leader, of the risky leader. Uh, you also have a, a Machiavelli quote here, uh, one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived. So we've lived some uh, difficult times, uh, not only in the US, but worldwide recently that I think uh, the, these kinds of things resonate. But then there's a better side to things, there's the better leaders. And I do wanna emphasize that we need to find those better leaders, whether it's in government, society, or universities, or uh, business. And the opportunity here, I love this uh, quote from Voltaire, uh, 18th century French writer, with great power comes great responsibility. I really love that because it, it talks to leadership, uh, servant leadership, the, the leader who uh, is thinking about their stakeholders, who they are, what they need, their expectations, their needs, et cetera. And then we have a nice quote here from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. Um, again, a very simple concept, but a really uh, nice one that resonated with me. And I uh, have those quotes in the leadership chapter of my book. Now here is something that I've developed over the years. Probably the first time I put this together was 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, in presentations that I was making when I was a corporate executive to uh, business people, uh, high level board or executive level people um, who um, you know, I was working with or, or working for. And I found over the years that this really resonates. It's very simple, simplistic, but I think it really works. And I call it an ESGT leadership typology because it's focusing on what kind of a leader do you have? And this could be business, it could also be government, it could also be any other kind of entity, what kind of a leader do you have when it comes to these ESGNT issues, the environmental, the social, the governance, the technology? And I like to think of those as an, a portfolio of issues, risks and opportunities, because um, they are issues, risks and opportunities that are often ignored or not thought of as part of strategy, as part of uh, the business planning and so on. So, um, what kind of a leader do you have when it comes to these kinds of issues? Not the financial success or you know, some of the other uh, metrics that we use, but the metrics of intangibles, if, if you wanna call it that. Um, and starting at the very bottom, you can see photos there of um, Sepp Blatter, the former disgraced CEO of FIFA, who uh, you know, after many years of corruption finally resigned. And then you have uh, to the right there, Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos, which also imploded. It was basically a biotech firm that um, ended up in disgrace because it was full of fraud and misrepresentation and uh, her leadership style was pretty much um, rock bottom and she's now being prosecuted. These are the what I call the irresponsible leaders, the ones that do not care about are ignorant of or you know, uh, intentionally antagonistic towards ESG and T issues. Uh, all they care about is the money or the fame or the fortune, et cetera. Next level is a superficial leader. This is the leader we see in a lot of different companies, um, uh, certainly in business, 
where they use ESG and T issues as a marketing or PR tool. It's really the greenwashing um, kind of leader who's not really into it except for the marketing that it gets for. Then we have the top two, which are the responsible leader and the enlightened leader. And those two um, really do take ESG and T issues seriously. The responsible leader uh, sets the right tone from the top, uh, has, uh, you know, uh, provides enough resources to the various people who are running environmental, social governance and technology programs and, and policies and so on, and really does a good job. The, what distinguishes the enlightened leader is that they go above and beyond, not only as a good role model and providing resources, but they actually integrate ESG and T into their products and services. So they actually make better products and services. And you have a picture on the one hand there of Paul Pullman, who is the Unilever uh, CEO for many years. Sorry, I live in New York City. There's an ambulance passing by. <laughs> um, so he, he is known as one of the real leaders when it comes to creating sustainable value, uh, integrating all of these co concerns and, and uh, issues into the products and services. And Microsoft's current CEO is, is also considered to be uh, an enlightened leader in that not only does he lead uh, on these issues in a responsible way, but he's also constantly looking at what's next and trying to do what's ethical. Doesn't mean that they always succeed, but it means that they're trying. So here are a couple of other slides that I've taken from Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a highly recommend uh, every year they come out with a survey of stakeholders around the world, asking them a lot of questions about four different kinds of institutions. And um, the institutions are government, business, media, and nonprofits. And they're always gauging the level of trust that stakeholders have in those entities. And this very interesting slide from the 2020 uh, Trust Barometer shows that for those stakeholders, meaning a, a large swath of society, ethical drivers are three times more important to creating company trust than competence. So this is for the business world, a very important piece. Um, competence is important, but uh, they have three gauges there, integrity, purpose, and dependability, uh, which they define in whole as ethics which really trump competence, uh, you know, three to one. So that's an interesting data point in terms of the ethical leadership that, that, we, that we want in business and that stakeholders want in business, but we don't always find. Here's another really cool graphic that Edelman uh, put together this year where they compared last year to this year. Uh, if you look at the light gray uh, lower triangle, um, there's a lot of action here today, sorry. <laughs> the lower, triangle is 2020 and the uh, the sort of the uh, triangle on top is 2021 and what it shows is on this ethical uh, and competence xy axis they've plotted the four institutions this trust in the four institutions and um, you have government media ngos and business there and on the one hand uh, you have competency and the other you have uh, how ethical they are and the only institution that is somewhat ethical is business. Everybody else is uh, on the unethical side uh, or on, I'm sorry, not the uh, NGOs. The NGOs are also on the ethical side, um, but business is the only one that has competency and is ethical, which is interesting. Uh, they weren't last year, if you look at this graph. So again, there's a very much of a distrust in leaders whatever uh, institution they're in, government uh, gets the prize for worst uh, in terms of unethical and incompetent. Um, media is kind of uh, close by and then NGOs are more ethical but less competent. So an interesting graphic to think about in terms of uh, ethical leadership. And here are a few things that I uh, discuss in my book about, uh, there's a leadership chapter where I talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, I'm not going to uh, dwell on the ugly right now because we're talking about ethical leaders. So I want to talk about um, what are the competencies of, of good leaders. And this is straight out of a survey from a Harvard Business Review uh, of 360 uh, CEOs from around the world asked to, uh, to rank their, the most important competencies for good leadership. And lo and behold, the number one, 67% of respondents said, has high ethical and moral standards. 
Um, now, not all CEOs are, have high ethical and moral standards, but at least 67% of them said that it wasn't the most important um, measure uh, of, of leadership. And you can see other things on this, on this slide in terms of what is important. Some of them are also sort of go around the issue of empathy and understanding and giving flexibility, uh, being open to new ideas and approaches, um, creating a feeling of togetherness, of succeeding and failing. So again, um, very interesting, uh, I think, data point. And here you have, um, uh, I, I actually talk about Microsoft as a, as a case study in, in a couple of the chapters, where you have someone like Satya Nadella, who came in about six, seven years ago as the new CEO, and really transformed the culture of Microsoft from something very different from what it was in the past. And um, this uh, chart shows you the five-year returns for um, Microsoft between 2014 and 2019, which is the period that he was there. And you can see that not only the culture got better, and there are some other indicators of, of a, a better culture, better reputation, but also the earnings got better. So there's a relationship there between uh, you know, good leadership, ethical leadership, and uh, hopefully also uh, financial returns and other kinds of returns. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to show you something interesting uh, from this year's Edelman Trust Barometer, which has been in a couple of the last year, uh, last couple of years as well. Um, but there's this very strong indication, which I think is really important for the business world to think about, very strong indication that stakeholders, including shareholders, but others as well, like employees and customers and what have you, um, really want CEOs to speak publicly about ESG and T issues. Let's put it that way, ethical issues, social issues, environmental issues, and um, tech ethics issues. And so you can see here, for example, that 78% of those who responded um, want those CEOs to, to speak publicly. And you have the top issues there, pandemic impact, which has a variety of ESG and T impacts, uh, workforce, health and safety, diversity, et cetera, job automation, the future of work, societal issues, again, a variety of things uh, like uh, you know, diversity and inclusion, um, health and safety in the workplace, remote working, so on. And then local community issues. So again, I think this just gives you uh, a sense of what good leadership looks, looks like in the 21st century based on a number of different data points. So now let me kind of move into um, what is ESG and T. So here I just wanted to sort of, uh, again, I think there's a coming together of trends and, and needs uh, in the world that we live in, which is a very fraught, very turbulent world. Um, and ESG, um, for many of you, you know this, um, was something that's been around for a while, um, certainly in Europe, a little less uh, long, uh, uh, less uh, duration here in the US. But starting a few years ago, we had a couple of really major investors like Larry Fink from BlackRock, uh, State Street, <clears throat> Vanguard, and other big asset uh, firms that, that are investors who are starting to put pressure on CEOs and on businesses to uh, think about the climate change issues, think about the tech ethics issues, think about the social issues. And the US is sort of caught up with, the, with Europe, uh, which has been ahead of the game for many years. But suddenly you can just see it in this chart, uh, you know, a visual speaks louder than words. Uh, you can see this <clears throat> Morningstar chart showing sustainable funds over a period of about 10, 12, 11 years. And it's in the last year or two, year and a half, that it's just skyrocketed. And that's not even showing some of the even larger inflows that we've seen. So suddenly the financial world and the world of ESG or sustainability are coming together. And here, uh, I wrote a piece about a year ago uh, about, uh, about this. And uh, Davos, uh, the, the big uh, World Economic Forum meeting had a big to do about ESG. It was all about purpose. This was January of 2020, which is literally right before COVID hit uh, in a big way. Um, but that was already the, already the noise that was going on. And so uh, here are some of the antecedents, uh, some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years, uh, which, I, which I outline in this article. But basically there's been a momentum and this momentum has become a tsunami as far as I'm concerned over the last year, because in the last year, the pandemic didn't 
uh, dampen these things, it actually exposed more and more of our underlying environmental, ethical, social governance, tech governance, tech ethics issues. And so leaders have to start thinking about that. So that's why in my book, um, and before I, the pandemic, but I still was thinking, you know, there's so many technology issues that we're not thinking about as part of ESG. Uh, you know, some people throw in uh, data privacy and cyber uh, breaches under the S. Well, maybe, but let me, let me put it this way. We're living in a really interconnected, complex world. And this is a picture from the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Risks Report, which they come out every year. And it's a really great resource where they have five categories of systemic global risk. And this shows how interconnected and codependent everything is. And there's a lot more detail in their reports, which I really recommend to those of you interested. Um, but here's why I think we need to go to an, a sense of ESG plus T. Technology suffuses everything we do. I mean, think about if the pandemic had hit 10 years ago, we wouldn't be doing this right now. We wouldn't have the capability of a Zoom webinar with people anywhere in the world uh, tuning in. And that replicated a million times because that's how we do work. That's how we study. Uh, that's how we interact with friends and family. Uh, so again, technology is uh, moving at the speed of light, changing every day. And it's not just you know, uh, virtual and digital, it's also uh, biological, uh, nanotechnology, um, you know, the world of AI, um, and all the implications that come where we're not thinking about the governance, we're not thinking about the diversity, we're not thinking about a lot of the things that we need to think about at the inception of these products. So technology is touching all aspects of life. And if businesses, if government, if society aren't incorporating a portfolio view of these issues into how they do business every day, how they act every day, how they create products, how they interact with their stakeholders, they're missing a huge piece of the puzzle and it's gonna come back to bite rather than to create opportunity, which is what I'm trying to convey here. So speaking of opportunity and the good part of this, Here's just a, um, you know, a summary that I put together. It's also in the book where I, I looked at the SDGs and I know this is one of uh, Scott's favorite uh, areas to think about uh, in terms of cybersecurity and the SDGs and cyber peace. Um, and this is just a quick chart. And I kind of just put together my thoughts on this, looked at each of the 17 SDGs and then uh, try to categorize which ones fall under which uh, category of environmental, social governance or technology. And I, I checked off all of the boxes for technology because there are uh, ways that technology can help or hinder um, each of one of these SDGs, which again, the sustainable development goals, which are supposed to be uh, reached in 2030, which uh, I wish us luck, but at least we, we have something to motivate us, right? Uh, we need to focus the, the, the um, the attention of business, of government, of society on these 17 goals. And the UN, for example, has a, a big data for SDGs um, where they've basically tried to mix and match um, business and society uh, and government to address some of the ways to uh, use big data and digital technology to solve for each of these 17. So that's great. To me, that's where the good is, where the opportunity and the value creation is. So let me now um, talk a little bit about how ethical leaders transform this ESG and T risk into sustainability. I have a few examples. I don't know if you want me to pause for a second, if there are any questions or comments before I jump into the next segment. Happy to. Yeah, if there's any, there are indeed one, it looks like. So Jay um, was asking if you wouldn't mind, Andrea, um, uh, about, uh, you might be able to see it there as well, whether you anticipate a significantly higher ESG for government institutions given the recent change of administration. So obviously a core focus of the Biden administration on, you know, climate, um, you know, and, and frankly on technology and data governance. Do you see those two worlds colliding in some interesting ways potentially? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting uh, not to get political, but um, I think that, we were at a fork in the road on, on a lot of these issues and the elections have consequences. And so uh, with the election of a, an administration 
that has already made very strong signals about ESG. Uh, we're going to see a whole series of ESG and technology uh, changes being addressed. Um, and, you know, I think, for example, if you just look at the new SEC commissioner that's been appointed, um, I think it's Gensler's his last name. Uh, he's very well known uh, for being a big proponent of ESG. And, um, and they're going to start looking at, at companies' uh, disclosures, especially the environmental ones, uh, to see if um, you know, they are being properly done because we don't have metrics that are yet settled for a lot of things. So you know, we're still in a journey where we're, we're sort of building the plane and, and uh, flying at the same time, right? And so I think um, ESG is going to become much more important from a government standpoint, where they're going to be demanding more from business. At the same time, I think business um, has a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, in, the, in this whole world of uh, new technology and environmental needs and, you know, the whole circular economy piece where you, you want to invent ways of um, addressing both the waste and the, and the excess, uh, while at the same time creating new value for, um, for stakeholders and, and customers and others. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. We're also going to have... Um, I think uh, more reporting and disclosure taking place on a broader set of things, not just the environmental piece, but uh, social and governance uh, and potentially more technology because there's also cybersecurity reporting that is being discussed and, and, and considered. And Scott and I are very involved with, with these kinds of topics um, with our friends at the Cyber Future Foundation and, and others. And um, there was a piece I co-wrote with a friend, uh, Maya Bunt from Swiss Re, uh, where we looked at the idea of cyber uh, resilience, um, external reporting, and whether it's a good idea or not. So these things are, are bubbling to the surface, and they're necessary for stakeholders. So uh, in, in a long way, winded way of saying, uh, I think there's a lot of change in the right direction that will be taking place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Yeah, sure. good question, Jay. We can, I'm sure, build more on that toward the end of here. Course. Too. Yeah, absolutely. So let me move on here. Um, so yeah, so the question I was asking here is how do ethical leaders transform ESG and T risk into sustainability? So, um, you know, a, a few of the major trends that are taking place uh, include um, this idea that stakeholders are really coming out of the woodwork. Uh, we used to just think of, certainly in the business context, we used to just think of um, shareholders are king. Um, you know, the whole legal and fiduciary system is set up so that it's really focused on improving the financial returns and watching over the financial well-being uh, of shareholders and owners. Um, but more and more over the last few years, I think we were coming to a place of stakeholder capitalism, if you want to call it that. Some people are calling that. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonably good term because I think in some ways business has lagged behind the um, almost asymmetric power that, that uh, some stakeholders have through social media. So, you know, one disgruntled customer who gets abused on an airplane can tweet about it and suddenly it's viral and it hits the reputation of the, of the uh, airliner. And so... There's a, there's a shift taking place because of technology uh, in a big way, I think social media certainly, and the dark side of that, which is the fake news aspect, the misinformation, um, the false information that also goes viral. And so businesses have to be, businesses and others, not just businesses, certainly government entities, universities, um, you know, just about any entity out there has to mind its uh, reputation risk, um, has to mind uh, you know, what is being said about them needs to have some tools to be able to, um, you know, to, to understand what stakeholders are saying about them. So it's really, really important to be uh, close to your stakeholders, understand their expectations, understand where things can go wrong, and have tools in your toolkit um, to uh, track risk before it becomes a really big risk, and have good internal enterprise risk management and all these other things that are best practices. So stakeholders are king. And at the same time, you have on this uh, slide uh, and a uh, slide from uh, Standard & Poor's where they tracked the number of ESG regulations that have um, existed in, uh, since time immemorial. And they start at 1997 with zero. 
And this ends in 2018 with over 300. There's probably four or 500 by now, it, probably. Uh, in terms of um, regulations by governments, whether they're state, local, uh, you know, national or international, like the EU, for example, has uh, requirements of ESG reporting from, um, from certain larger size companies that operate within their borders. And you, know, you could say the same thing, uh, technology regulations, uh, this is not tracked here. And this is why I, I'm a proponent of ESG and T because I think there's a lot of additional regulatory stuff that's happening, certainly with the tech industry. And it may uh, happen in a bigger way in the US than it has in the past. It certainly has in Europe. So again, um, the ethical leaders of the 21st century need to pay attention to these forces of both the stakeholders and the regulators. Um, and the next few slides, I just want to give you some sort of point counterpoint of some of the risks and opportunities that I think are out there um, that we need to be vigilant. Everybody who works in an organization needs to be vigilant down to the, you know, the, the just the email uh, phishing uh, training that you need to not click on the wrong uh, on the wrong link that comes to you from an unknown source that then infects your computer and your whole organization's computer. And we have some pretty amazing major attacks that have happened. I mean, th this is solar winds here um, uh, and COVID related uh, attacks, but we all know that Microsoft email servers have been attacked in the last few days which also seems to be huge um, in terms of affecting many organizations. So again, we're in an era of grave risk when it comes to technology issues. Um, the pandemic has only worsened it. Um, you know, the solar winds case started before the pandemic, but it penetrated um, vast government agencies and uh, Fortune 500 companies um, through solar winds, which was a third party provider. Uh, of software that was corrupted and ended up in all of these different places. They're incredibly clever people um, behind these attacks. They're usually nation state actors when it becomes these massive attacks. And we don't know the half of it, not even a quarter of it yet in terms of what it means. Is it just something that was a penetration for espionage or are there things that are lurking in these companies and government agencies that could be much more destructive. So uh, SolarWinds is one that's unfolding that's huge. Interpol uh, has also tracked some of the COVID related cyber threats. Um, and again, bad times bring out bad people. And uh, here we have uh, you know, countless uh, criminal organizations, maybe some nation states as well that have been attacking um, a variety of, of um, uh, private parties uh, around the world, including hospitals, healthcare, pharma, where the COVID relief is being given to people, uh, putting them in grave danger of losing people, of, of losing intellectual property like vaccines. Um, so you have phishing scams as, as the top uh, threat during the COVID pandemic. You have malware and ransomware as the second greatest malicious domains and then fake news. So. There's a lot of risk out there. This is the T and ESG and T. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is the T, capital T and ESG and T. And this has to be part of a portfolio strategic thinking process that organizations uh, and their leaders, their ethical leaders adopt. Um, but there is really a good news story to the, to the capital T <laughs> in ESG and T as well. Um, here are two stories that I think are really, really, uh, they resonate with me in a big way. The one on the left, uh, artificial intelligence counts 1.8 billion trees in the Sahara Desert. When I saw that, I said, what? <laughs> and, um, you know, the Sahara Desert is the vastest, I think, uh, desert in the world. And yet it has trees, not just trees, but 1.8 billion. So this is a research project that, um, that has allowed through drones and AI has allowed scientists to understand what's going on in the Sahara, which they would never have been able to without the drones and without the AI. So to me, it gives me chills to see this. It's very exciting. Uh, and it means that scientists really have the opportunity to solve some of our problems 
with these new technologies that we couldn't even dream of even 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, on the right is, is another just spectacular scientific accomplishment in the midst of our turbulence, in the midst of our dark times. And this is a comparative chart over the years showing the various uh, serious uh, diseases that we've combated as humans, uh, starting with uh, typhoid fever and polio, and showing how long it took for the scientists of the time to find vaccines or cures. And you look at the bottom there, the coronavirus, everything happened in nine months. We discovered the disease, it became a pandemic, and scientists of the world united in a way that I, I can't even imagine. And technology played an amazing role there. So did ethical leadership, by the way, not necessarily at the nation state level, but between the scientific organizations. Um, you know, while we had China and America finger pointing and fighting, uh, the scientists from China and America and everywhere else were working together trying to get these vaccines done. So to me, that's a really great news story. And and I just got my first vaccine yesterday. So, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, feel, I feel incredibly blessed um, that I am living in today's world and able to get a vaccine. I know many, many people are not as privileged and as lucky, but I hope that, you know, with incredible um, mobilization that's taking place of creating vaccines and, you know, making sure that everybody gets one uh, and with the change of administration, I think we we come a little closer to being able to do that, uh, sharing with the rest of the world, and and making sure that uh, you know everybody gets um, gets a vaccine sooner rather than later. So that's a, a good news story that I really think is so important. Um, let me show you again a sort of point counterpoint. So this is a sort of a wheel of ESG and T risks that have come out of. The pandemic and I, I've put this together because it really shows the interconnectedness that the World Economic Forum talks about, that I talk about, how these risks of today, these big systemic risks, um, are kind of interact with one another, uh, push and shove uh, other risks coming out. And so, if you start on the on the coronavirus, the purple picture on the on the far left. Um, so that was an environmental issue that happened to begin with in, we think, in China, where animal viruses jumped over to human species, whether it was uh, in a market or in a lab or whatever, but it was a bat-hosted virus that came over apparently to, to humans. That's how the, and, and the reason, a lot of scientists are saying this, the reason this happened is that we are deforesting and destroying the natural habitat of a lot of animals. And so we're coming much closer into contact with them, whether it's because we're closer together or because we slaughter them for food, whatever it is, we got it. So this is part of the environmental degradation that's taking place. So from there, we have the virus coming out. I have a picture there of the US uh, at its worst um, in the middle of last year and towards the end of last year where the, the spread of the pandemic of the virus uh, was just enormous. And we are probably, uh, there may be one or two other countries that are maybe worse per capita, but we are one of the worst uh, cases of this pandemic. And it affected society in a number of different ways. And we've had political, <laughs> uh, political implications, ideological, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, just chasms between people. Um, it's also led to um, this uh, situation where the killing of a black man in Minneapolis uh, became a focal point for everybody who saw it, number one, but also um, a social uh, situation that's untenable, a, a, a situation of racism that uh, just came to the fore when everybody was at home and didn't really have anything else to do. And we all kind of went out there to talk about it, right? Um, so, so the social justice issues, uh, the racism issues came out. Go further down to uh, the, the slaughterhouse picture there. And that is a, a social issue and a governance issue. It's a social issue in that our frontline workers were often the least paid, the least protected, 
and they ended up uh, you know, putting their lives at risk because they needed to work. Some of us were lucky we could work from home or study from home. So again, that's a governance issue that is spilled over into companies. How are you gonna govern your worker safety, your worker health? Um, so that was a governance issue. Uh, finally, going to the bottom of this, uh, of this wheel, um, we have governance and technology intertwining. Um, I mentioned before the US election of 2020, the fake news. Uh, all this stuff came out during the pandemic as well. And it was exacerbated by the fact that we had such a changed social environment um, and a political environment. And then last but not least, uh, in the technology piece at the bottom there, I have the ransomware in, health, in healthcare, which um, was worse than ever. And it was worse than ever because the, uh, the bad actors in cyber uh, were taking advantage of a pandemic to try to get money out of hospitals and healthcare facilities, et cetera. So all of this is interconnected during a year of um, systemic risk. So let me go to the better news picture, <laughs> which is um, you know, this whole idea that because we have technology, because we have digital capabilities, uh, we can also do a lot to combat some of the things that, that have become so obvious during this last year, which were always there, but came to the surface because of uh, the pandemic situation. And so again, I'm sharing with you the big data for, uh, and the SDGs um, where the UN is basically um, getting private, public uh, and social partnerships off the ground to combat those 17, uh, uh, not combat, but to achieve those 17 sustainable development goals. And so here you have little examples uh, for each of the 17 of what data science and analytics can do to contribute to sustainable development. And if you just take a look, you know, um, clean water and sanitation, uh, sensors connected to water pumps can track access to clean water. Um, if you look at, um, you know, responsible consumption and production, online search patterns or e-commerce transactions can reveal the pace of transition to energy efficient products. So again, Capabilities, you know, some of this leapfrogging that can take place sometimes in the poorest places in the world can happen with this kind of technology. As for example, uh, one of the things that happened in the last couple of decades in Africa, they didn't have, in many countries, they didn't have um, the hardwired telephones, but they had the cell phone towers and the, and the mobile technology. And they are way ahead of us in some ways in terms of not having to deal with this old infrastructure and having you know, the new digital technology. So this leapfrogging is really possible through technology. And I think it's a great opportunity, not only to make the world a better place, but for people to make money and people to invest and, and so on. Um, this is just, uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier, the, the global risks report that the World Economic Forum puts out every year. Uh, and here you see an XY graph um, showing their most important systemic global risks that they've plotted for this year, uh, 2021. Uh, this came out in January of 2021, post pandemic, of course. So it includes uh, considerations of the pandemic. And what they usually do, they plotted on this uh, typical sort of risk um, uh, matrix of uh, impact low to high and likelihood low to high. And these are their highest impact and likelihood um, systemic risks uh, for the year. And they have five categories. They have environmental, economic, uh, geopolitical, technological, and societal. And they talk about this interconnectedness of risk. And uh, if you take a look, I mean, last year, um, infectious diseases made it to number 10 uh, of their top most likely uh, risks. Today, you can see for 2021, it's, a, it's the highest impact, almost highest risk, um, climate action failure, and a few other um, weather-related risks are the ones that um, have the highest uh, potential uh, impact and likelihood. Um, but infectious diseases suddenly leapfrogged uh, to the top there because it happened. Um, you can see in the purple, uh, uh, the purple buttons here um, are the technological issues. And the most, um, the most likely and, and highest impact together is cybersecurity failure. 
Um, then you also have digital power concentration, which goes to the point of you know, technology, the, the FANG technologies in the US, the companies that, you know, the Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, uh, who, el who else is there? <laughs> um, the biggest technology companies um, have a lot of concentrated power. And one of the big um, discussions right now, certainly in the EU, but starting in the US, I think more and more is we need to regulate them somehow because they're allowing all kinds of Wild West stuff to happen, um, like fake news and and other kinds of things that have actual damaging consequences on people. People die, um, so it's not it's not you know something to think about uh, superficially. Uh, tech governance failure is in there too. Digital inequality is in there. So these are all technology systemic technology issues that are risky issues that are part of the portfolio of doing business in this world today. But when you do it well, you can also have an opportunity. This is a great chart. Um, uh, I came across the work of Just Capital, which is an NGO that tracks um, how stakeholders feel about companies based on a bunch of issues that are weighted and they poll uh, the American public on this. And so this is a their first ranking, 2021 ranking, of America's largest publicly traded companies on issues that matter to those stakeholders like employees and customers. And um, it's basically the issues that are in the ESG and T world. Uh, and they found in this, um, in this first uh, ranking that they did, uh, these top five companies, all of them technology companies, uh, have the best rankings um, of all publicly traded companies. So these are all technology companies they're all ranked as being really high on some of the stakeholder issues that are work-related issues, social issues, and so on. So something must be going right in these companies for the stakeholders to say this, right? Doesn't mean they're perfect, doesn't mean they can't have a big fall from one day to the next. But I think it's really important that um, we learn what they're doing right um, uh, because they apparently are on some of these ESG and T issues. So there's great opportunity for others who are not on this list to think about how do I become a better leader? How do I become a better pro uh, product and service provider? Um, and it's interesting that the top five are all technology companies. They're more flush with cash than some other companies like oil and gas right now, I think, <laughs> or some others. Um, the, the sixth one on this list, by the way, was JP Morgan, another company fl flush with cash. But uh, when you have cash, you can do stuff for your stakeholders. When you don't, <laughs> it becomes more of a, a battle. Um, so let me just uh, end with a couple of quick thoughts on um, thinking about this holistically. This is also part of um, how I you know, address this in my book. At the very end, I talk about, well, how do we achieve these things and why do we want to achieve these things? Um, the ESG and T, the st strategic approach to these issues, having the right tone from the top and all that. Uh, why do we wanna do it? Well, I think it actually builds sustainable resilience, sustainable organizational resilience, and it creates value. So the last two chapters of the book talk about the resilience building and the value creation. When I say value creation, I don't just mean money. I mean, some of the trust, the reputation, uh, you know, some of the stuff that Just Capital talks about in terms of their stakeholders, how stakeholders feel about companies, because that then, helps you attract the better talent, helps you uh, navigate some of the difficult times when you have a crisis or a scandal and so on. So I have a model of the uh, organizational resilience and it has eight, um, eight aspects to it. And this is, this is the one that is about uh, not having these things, but I wanna show you the one that has the eight elements of uh, resilience uh, in its best possible shape. There's a lot of detail in the book about it. I'll just give you the highlights here. But basically, you, you start first and foremost with really good governance. The ethical leaders we've been talking about, the people who pay attention to the stakeholders and understand the issues and who are proactive in their governance, not leaning back and sitting back. Empowered Integrity talks about the culture that those kinds of leaders create. Uh, it's a trickle down and a trickle up of uh, dealing with the issues, dealing with the risks and opportunities. So uh, having those ethics and compliance and risk management uh, and other kinds of things built into the system. Uh, the third thing is knowing your stakeholders really well, having stakeholder emotional intelligence. 
Uh, fourth is having good enterprise risk management and, and a way of finding your issues early, dealing with them, and so on. Um, then the fifth one is a holistic ESGNT strategy. When you have good governance, a good culture, understand your stakeholders and have good risk management, then you can integrate those most important ESGNT issues into your business strategy. And this applies to nonprofits and other kinds of entities as well. You have to put teeth into it also by having a performance system, a performance management system that doesn't just reward people for financial gains, but also for metrics around ESG and T topics. So if you're a technologist, an engineer who's creating AI, um, uh, how, it's not just how many uh, you know, software programs did you sell, it's what did you put into that software program? Did you pay, pay attention to the AI ethics and diversity issues at the creation, at the inception of those products and services? So be rewarded, not just for the financial outcome, but also the ethical outcomes and the ESG and T outcomes. Having crisis readiness is another really important piece of this puzzle. And then when you have all these things in a really good sort of assembled, uh, well-running sort of uh, clockwork, uh, that gives you the opportunity to do lessons learned and to improve products and services and maybe even create new value. And that's why the innovation ethos, I think, is most possible in organizations that have all these elements in place, uh, starting with good governance and, and um, that culture that allows people to operate uh, in a way that they don't feel uh, oppressed or unethical or um, otherwise unable to speak up. So that's the virtuous resilience life cycle that I think uh, organizations that come close to this are the ones that have competitive advantage. They have ethical leaders. Um, they incorporate their ESG and T issues. And um, I think they have a better chance of survival and maybe even doing better uh, thriving, so to speak. Um, so that completes my prepared remarks, uh, Scott. I don't know if uh, you have questions, comments, uh, if anybody else has any. Um, I can't hear you. No, that was just brilliant. I just didn't want to interrupt you at the end there, Andrea. But first off, a round of applause. I'm sure everyone is joining thank me you, right now you. from their <laughs> homes and offices because that was just amazing. I can't believe the amount of rich content that you fit in <laughs> to the last. It's all from the book. It, it took me forever to write it. So, <laughs> well, it, no, well, it, it, it you would never know, but it was it's just amazing. So thank you so much, Andrea. And I, it's it's such a fantastic book. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but I want to make sure everybody has a chance. So while I'm asking, perhaps just the first one to get us going, remember folks to please feel free, use that Q&A feature, um, you know, raise your hand if you prefer, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, just to get us going, one thing that you referenced in your talk, Andrea, is this, you know, this a, a little bit of a movement. I'm not even sure if we can call it a trend yet. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, about using the sustainability reporting frameworks, even like GRI, right? Um, to talk about the impact of the firm's operations, as you say, not just on ESG, but also now plus T. And I'm, I'm mindful of, for example, Eli Lilly up the road here in Indianapolis, that they now do a little bit of this with their uh, medical devices, talking about impact on data privacy, um, IoT issues more generally. And I'm wondering, have you seen that trend now kind of more broadly, not, in, not only in finance, but across some of these under, other sectors like healthcare? Um, and if so, just based on your extensive experience working with so many boards of directors, does having that extra layer, you know, of information, does, does that, is that starting to contribute to some of the debates that are taking place? Um, yes and yes. I mean, uh, and, you know, you mentioned Eli Lilly, and I, I've known some of the people there over the years, especially when I was an ethics and compliance officer, I met some of their, some of my counterparts um, and others. And they've done a lot of really good work in this area in terms of integrating, uh, especially their environmental issues. This is, goes back a while into strategy. They had their ethics and compliance people uh, working with their strategy people. So they were actually doing this a long time ago, which is really cool. Another pharma company that I think does it really well and has been, uh, and I'm again familiar with some of the people there, uh, is Merck. Um, they've had really great leadership over the years um, and uh, who, who have put ethics and put uh, ESG kinds of issues at the forefront and their boards have too. 
Um, I don't think they are the rule, they're, they're the exception. So, um, you know, I, I like to call out the, the good examples and not necessarily dump on the bad examples. But, um, but I think, um, especially with this last year, this whole ESG um, movement is definitely catching on because the investment community is pushing for it. Uh, you know, the Larry Finks and the Black Rocks and the, uh, you know, the Vanguards and others are requiring this and investors broadly want to understand what, what are you doing for climate change? What are you doing for your workers uh, during the pandemic? And this has trickled up to the board and I've seen a real change in the boardroom. Uh, they're finally, in my opinion, finally pay paying attention to ESG. They're also paying attention to digital issues and to cyber, of course, because now cyber is everywhere and it's hurting them. So yeah, I think this is yes and yes. Excellent, and, and, and that's certainly encouraging. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a hope springs eternal kind of person, but I'm also a realist and I really think things have changed. I hear in you. In a good way. Pr pragmatic optimist, right? I, I like to subscribe to that same, <laughs> that same camp. Um, I, you know, I haven't done it. It'd be interesting to tool around on some of these databases, like the GRI database, just to see if you can search, you know, by some of these, you know, even keywords yeah. like data privacy and cybersecurity, see, see, see what's coming back. Um, yeah. Just while folks and Gabriel, hopefully that was useful. And I, I'd like to return to Jay's, you know, question in just a moment here as well, Andre, about the what the new administration can do, since still so much of the leadership seems to be until pretty recently, you know, coming from the private sector here. But just turning a little bit, um, you, you mentioned NGOs earlier in that kind of other unique quadrangle, right? Um, mm -hmm. But in my mind, at least, there's some interesting kind of work from civil society here as well. Oh, yeah. um, like Consumer Reports and their digital standard, right? Uh, I saw just that was the cover story on their most recent um, edition of the magazine, uh, just to better educate consumers about the privacy and cybersecurity features of the internet connected devices that they're purchasing. And, you know, trust marks kind of goes along with that, right? So I'm wondering, you know, is that, and, and that's and obviously places like Europe, much further along to my understanding, the CE trust mark now has some privacy and security um, aspects to, to, to their rating schemes there. Well, we're, we're, we're clearly not there yet to creating something like an energy star system uh, for cyber here in the States. But I'm wondering, is could that be another aspect or another like way that industry could help um, to form, you know, a type of coalition? Is, is that type of activity something you highlight perhaps, you know, um, in the book or could, could government as well, including the Biden administration, do more to encourage that type of yeah. um, that type of activity, a That's shared great. responsibility? Yeah, a great, great set of observations and uh, comments. Um, I don't actually talk about that much in the book, but I think that is an, a, a frontier of um, change that we should all encourage, you know, getting these good housekeeping seals of approval from organizations that you can trust, right? Whether it's a government organization or an NGO, I think the Consumer Reports uh, you know, example is really good. And there are some for-profit companies out there. I don't know how good they are, so I don't want to name names, but there are some that are trying to um, create scores on the cyber security of a company based on what they can gather from the outside. Um, you know, I don't know how good, bad, or indifferent that is, but we really do need, uh, I mean, it is a wild west out there. Even if you're a board member and you want to understand the cyber and the cyber solutions for your company, um, there's a million different providers out there. Who's, who's to say who's good, who's bad, and who's ugly, right? And so to understand who those service providers are and what the products and, and services, uh, how they're rated, are they, you know, I was just, um, I, I'm literally doing something from my own website, trying to understand the security profile and what I should purchase and not purchase to make it secure, right? Um, and so I, 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 I go to some of my trusted friends to get, to get the answer. And I'm lucky to have good trusted friends who know something about this, but um, most people don't and most companies don't. So yeah, I think we should have more ratings and, and seals of approval and that sort of thing. No, thanks so much, Andrea. And, and for what it's worth, um, Megan Stiefel, uh, another IU alum over at Public Knowledge has done some, some great work um, on looking at those intersections between sustainability and cybersecurity as well. Um, and based on your, your uh, reference um, to, to Eli Lilly as well earlier, we will have Meredith Harper, the current CISO of Eli Lilly in the IU CSCR uh, speaker series here coming up next month, which we're really excited about. 
Um, but for now, unfortunately, we are we are out of time, which I hate to say. So let me um, just thank you. Please join me in thanking as well, Andrea, once again. Thank you for having me. Thank you for talk. <laughs> and if, if you're listening to this now or watching it later, buy Andrea's book. It's fantastic. Fine. <laughs> And he has, he doesn't have a commission, so. <laughs> no, that's it. Oh, yeah. It's no it really is wonderful. And his books are fantastic, too. So, you know, touche. If you have trouble going to sleep at night, for sure. <laughs> so, no, th thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, Andre. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. You're a, you're a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> you're too kind. No, thanks. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And thanks, everybody, for joining as well. Hope to see you soon. Take care. <laughs>